everyone, I'm Abigail, this is Megan, and welcome to another Two Kids interview. We are joined by New York Times bestselling author Tracy Baptiste. Some of Miss Baptiste's books include The Totally Gross History of Ancient Egypt, The Jumbie series, The Picture Book Looking for a Jumbie, The New York Times bestselling Minecraft Universe book, The Crash, Cuz Claudette, African Icons, and more. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thanks for having me. There's a lot of folklore throughout the world. And while some of these stories have have lasted thousands of years, a lot of people may not be familiar with them. Can you start by telling our audience what a jumbie is? Sure. So jumbies are creatures from uh, Caribbean folklore. And they are the kinds of stories that people would tell at night, um, basically to scare little kids and to keep them inside at night. And jumbies are all different types of creatures. So there's a bunch of different kinds of jumbies and all of them are scary. All of them are meant to um, sort of change themselves so that during the day they might look like a regular person, but at night they look like a jumbie. And there's a whole bunch of different ones. So um, there might be one that um, kind of looks like a werewolf, and that one is called a lagahu. There's one that um, comes out at night and like um, sheds their skin and bursts into a big ball of fire looking for somebody so that they can drink their blood. Uh, that one's very much like a, a vampire, but that one's called a sukuya. Um, there's one that's like a little toddler sized um, one that has this really big mouth and backwards feet. And that one's called a duen. So there's a whole bunch of different kinds of jumpies. And people talk about all of these different creatures um, all over the Caribbean and South America. And they might be, because it's an oral tradition, the stories might be a little different depending on which island you go to or which country you go to, but they all have the same sort of similarity of being scary and just coming out at night and being these kinds of tricksters. Why is it important for you to bring these folk tales to life for more people? Well, Originally, when I first wrote the very first Jumbies book, I really just wanted my own kids to know about the folklore of the place that um, their parents came from, because both my husband and I come from Trinidad, where a lot of these stories are told. So originally, it really was just a way for my kids to connect with stories from their own heritage. But I quickly also realized that people really enjoy stories that come from cultures all over the world. And it it made me also realize that a lot of these stories from all over the world have very similar kinds of stories. And ultimately, I realized that writing these stories would help a lot of readers realize that we have a lot more in common than we think we do, because we have a lot of these same stories that are indigenous to all of these cultures from all over the world. We don't know how to describe you as an author. You've written middle grade horror books, picture books, nonfiction books for middle grade, nonfiction books for younger kids, a graphic nonfiction book, and a Minecraft universe book. We can't think of another author that does all that. First, do you have a favorite genre of those? I don't have a a favorite genre. I think that I probably feel most comfortable writing middle grade fiction. That's probably where I feel most comfortable. But I very much enjoy writing nonfiction books because it allows me to learn so many things as I'm writing, uh, whether it's writing nonfiction for younger readers or writing nonfiction for older readers. And with the graphic nonfiction, that was the very first time I had written um, a, a, a book in that particular format, and it was a lot of fun for me to learn how to do that. So I feel like as an author, the thing that I really love to do the most is explore. Um, and that's probably the place where I feel the best. That's probably the thing that I do the best as an author is explore different genres and explore different ways of telling stories. I really enjoy that the most. 
would you consider making a jumpy graphic novel? You know, a lot of people have asked me about making a graphic novel for the Jumbies, and I think they would make an excellent, excellent graphic novel series. Um, so yeah, that's definitely something that I will think about. Do you think it's harder switching between different genres? It can be difficult because the way that I think has to work differently depending on the genre that I'm working in and the story that I'm working in. So I can't add huge amounts of detail when I'm working in a picture book, for example, because there just isn't that kind of space. So I have to think differently if I know that I'm working on a picture book. And then if I'm switching to working on um, a graphic novel, I have to remember that a lot of the detail has to just stay in the dialogue because a lot of that atmosphere and a lot of those sort of um, landscape details and body movement details are going to be shown in the illustration that the illustrator does. So it can take me a little bit to sort of reorient my mind to remember like, okay, this is what I need to do for this particular kind of story. And this is what I need to do for this particular kind of story. But fortunately, I usually work on one project at a time. Um, and if I'm switching between projects, because if I'm getting notes on one project while I'm working on something else, I usually give myself like maybe half a day or something to like get my brain back into track of what I'm working on. Um, and I try not to switch back and forth between projects like within a week, um, because that can be really, really tough. So I'll work on one thing, maybe the beginning of a week and maybe work on something else the end of a week, but I, I can't go switching back and forth. Um, that that really is too hard for me to think about. There is more representation of different people in books now than there ever has been. You're a part of that important trend. What does that mean to you? It's great. Um, you know, growing up in Trinidad and Tobago, I was very fortunate because Trinidad has a lot of writers that come out of the country. And so I was reading writers who looked like me, who grew up where I lived. And so I had an opportunity to read um, books as a young uh, girl that came from where I came from. Um, but there weren't a huge, huge number of books. So a lot, a lot of the books that I read came from the United States or came from uh, Europe. And so there were a lot of characters who just didn't look like me. And then when I moved to this country, I realized that there were even fewer books that represented all of the people in this country. And I remember reading books that understood my experience, that spoke to my experience as a young girl and how that made me feel good, how that made me feel seen, how that made me feel connected. And so I think it is a great thing that there is a much wider variety of books now that can entice a lot of other people to enjoy reading because they will be able to connect more. So I'm really thrilled to be a part of that right now. A few months ago on our sister channel, Pictured Reviews, Megan and I reviewed The Little Mermaid. We both loved it and thought Ariel was great. Some people were ridiculously upset because Ariel was played by a person of color. As a person who writes folk tales, can you give us your thoughts about that per from that perspective? Sure. So funny enough, um, the book that you, you have that you're showing there, Rise of the Jumbies, has a Caribbean mermaid named Mama Jlo on the cover. And she is half beautiful woman and half anaconda. And she also rules over all of those sort of regular mermaids in the sea. And I've written her into that particular book. So I have been writing a lot of um, characters that are mermaids or um, similar, or like have a lot of similarities to other mythological creatures that, that people know. So when Disney announced that Halle Bailey was going to be the next Ariel, and there was this, as you say, ridiculous backlash, um, I wrote something for the New York Times about all of the other Black mermaids that I was aware of, including Mama Jaleno, that's on the cover of my book. And there are so many different types of mermaids from so many different parts of the world um, that I really wanted people to understand that 
Ariel, who is um, it comes from the European storytelling culture, she, it comes from a Danish story, is by far and away not the only way that a mermaid can exist. And the idea of um, a mythological creature not being able to look a certain kind of way is a little bit silly because it is already a made-up creature. Um, and it kind of does not make sense that you would then impose rules on what a made-up creature could look like. Um, so I, I, I started talking about all of the different kinds of mermaids that there are like in different cultures, like in Japan, for example, um, their mermaids only have the head of a human being. All the rest of it is fish. And um, in New Zealand, the mermaids have these crazy long tongues because they use their tongues to like knock over boats and things like that. So there's all of these different varieties of mermaids that exist in stories all over the world. And people were just imposing this very, very narrow view of what a mermaid could be when Disney cast Halle Bailey. And so in talking about that, I really wanted to, people to be exposed to a wider variety of mermaids so they could understand that this was not anything to be upset about. We've interviewed a number of writers who have had books banned. This means in some parts of the country, kids don't have the same access to books that we have. Can you give us your thoughts on this current trend? So this is um, this is a dangerous trend when people are trying to impose rules on who can read what and who can experience what. That is, this is a very, very dangerous kind of thing, especially in the United States, which is a place where people have wide freedoms to be able to make their own choices. There is no reason for the government or any kind of government entity like a school, school board, for example, to get in between what people can freely have access to. And the danger with a school board deciding that a book is appropriate or not appropriate becomes a problem for kids who do not have the ability to walk into a bookstore and buy whatever books they want, um, or um, don't have access to a public library system where they can borrow anything they want. If they are only getting books from their school system, as many kids have to because they don't have access in other ways, it is deliberately putting limitations on their freedoms and their ability to choose books. So this is a really very dangerous trend. Um, it is forcing kids into a particular, very narrow worldview. And I think, you know, you probably know that the more experiences you have, the more um, access you have to different kinds of stories and different kinds of ideas and different, even different ways of telling stories is a way to make people have empathy for others. It's a way to um, let people uh, be able to understand people who are unlike them. It is a way to show people how other people live and, and think and, and, and so on. But also, um, again, as you know, one of the things that I discovered I, as I was writing the Jumpy series is that even though you may have a story that comes out of one place, you're going to find that there's so many similarities um, with other stories and other people from in so many different places. And it once again shows how people are much more connected than they actually think. So the the advantage of having a wide range of stories really is more about connecting people and um, it brings more togetherness than um, than than separating than separating and, and and not having access to those those kinds of books and and a wide variety of stories the only um, thing that it's going to do is divide people more there are a lot of fans of minecraft including me was there a any extra pressure when writing that book, knowing that there is a fan base? You know, originally I did not even want to do the Minecraft book because I am not a Minecraft gamer at all. And so when Mojang asked me to write the book, I originally said no. But at the time, my son was 10 years old and he was and still is a huge, huge Minecraft fan. And he promised me that he would help me to write the book. So he promised that he would teach me about the game, 
He would read my manuscript pages and give me notes on it. He would answer any questions that I had at any time. And so I really wrote the book because of him, because he wanted me to do it. And because he promised that he would help me to um, know all the things that I needed to know for the book to work. Um, so because of that, I did not feel a lot of pressure when I was writing it. It was a lot of fun because then I was also able to do it with my son. But I also knew that the people from Mojang were also reading the book and they were also giving notes about things that could work or couldn't work, or um, you could make this better. You could, you need to change this this way because this is how the game works. So I had a lot of support for, for writing the book from um, Minecraft experts who were able to give me all the information that I needed to get to make sure that the fans would, would still really enjoy it. Writing isn't easy, and rejection seems to be a part of most writers' stories. Can you tell us about that part of your journey? Sure. So I still get rejections right now. Like There are times when I have a story, part of a story, or even just a story idea, and you know, people don't think that it has legs, right? Like it's, it's just not gonna make it. And that's okay, because not every single idea that you have is going to be a great idea. Not every single idea that you have is perfect right out the box. So when I get a rejection, what that means to me is one of two things, either A, it is just not gonna work, you know, the, the way that it is, um, you know, so I can either um, scrap it entirely, or I can go back and rework it, or B, I haven't given it enough thought yet. Maybe there's something there, but I need to give it more time to get to where it goes. So anytime I get a rejection, there's like two ways to go. It's either I go right back in and I try to revise it and try to make it better, or I'm going to let it sit for a while because maybe I need to give it more time so that I can um, get my ideas around it a little bit more to make it better. So I often have projects that are sitting there that are things that didn't quite make it out the gate right away. And either I'm actively working on it or I'm letting it sit and maybe I'll take it out and tinker with it a little bit here or there and then put it away again. Um, and The Jumbies actually was a book that was like that. The Jumbies was a book that um, I just was not able to figure out immediately. So I needed um, I needed more time to get it figured out. And it actually took me like nine years to be able to figure it out. What writer has had the most influence on you? Oh, that is a good question. Um, I want to say, hmm, that's a hard one. I feel like growing up, because I was growing up with a lot of people telling stories in my life that um, the people that were like oral storytellers in my house were the ones that had the most influence on me. So my mom, certainly for one, because she was a big storyteller of mine, but also I had an uncle Leo who was like one of the greatest storytellers and he could just like sit there and make up story on the fly or he would read stories and like add to them all of the time. And honestly, I feel like between the two of them, that kind of makes the best influences for me storytelling wise. What advice do you have for young people who want to write? Um, two things. One, uh, I know everybody says that you have to read a lot, but more specifically than that, you have to read a lot of different kinds of things. Like it's not just about um, reading the kinds of books that are like your favorite genre. You have to read a lot of different kinds of things. So if you um, tend to like really love nonfiction, you read a lot of nonfiction, maybe you want to read um, a historical novel or you want maybe you want to read some graphic novels. Uh, maybe you even want to read manga, just to see how people tell stories, because you will learn a lot from looking at how other people tell stories. So I learn a lot from um, reading all kinds of different things, even things that are like not really um, the, the, the kinds of things that I love all the time, because it's really interesting to me to see how somebody puts together ideas. Like I am not a poet and I don't write any poetry at all. But I love reading poetry because I love seeing how poets manipulate language. That's that's really um, interesting to me and always feels like it teaches me something. 
Um, so definitely reading a lot. Um, but the second thing is you have to sit down and write. And that requires discipline. That requires you saying, I'm going to work on this thing for X amount of time every day, whether it's 20 minutes or 30 minutes, or maybe it's not every day and you do it. Maybe if you say three days a week, I'm going to have 20 minutes to do writing. You have to really enjoy the discipline of sitting there and doing the work. So one is reading and reading widely. And the second one is enjoying the discipline of just sitting there and doing the writing work. Can you tell us about an upcoming project that you are currently working on? Sure. So right now I'm working on a new series that involves jumbies, but these are moko jumbies. So moko jumbies are creatures from, um, it's like the stilt walkers during um, Caribbean carnival. So they, it's, they dress up in costume and they're up on stilts and the costumes go all the way down to the floor and they dance and they're very joyous and it's a lot of fun. And it's something that I remember from being a kid growing up. And um, so this story um, is about a family that finds out that those moko jumbies are actually real creatures. They're not just people on stills, like they're actual people who can like sort of stretch and expand themselves. And they um, uphold the traditions of West Africa where mokos come from. So mokos were healers in West Africa. And, and so these kids, it's three cousins, they find out that their family are descended from these Moko Jumbies, that they have these abilities to heal, to protect, to um, see into the past and the future. And when we meet these three cousins, they're just figuring out that they have these abilities, that their family comes from this whole long tradition. And of course, the first thing that happens is there is some kind of creature that is coming and attacking like all of the magical people in their community. And so they, as these new Moko Jumbies, have to figure out who this creature is, what the creature wants, and stop it before people start getting hurt. And that one, um, the first in the Moko Magic series is called Carnival Chaos. And that one comes out um, actually exactly a year from now um, in August of 2024. I agree that. Me too. I'm glad. Finally, it's time for our Turbo 10. 10 rapid fire questions. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. Number one, what is your favorite phrase to use? Oh, my favorite phrase to use. Uh, let's go already. My kids are always late. Number two, what is one subject you'd love to learn more about? A uh, thing that I would love to learn more about is uh, physics. Like I happen to love astrophysics and I don't know a lot about it. And I, I would love to take a class. Number three, what is your go-to snack food? Cheetos. Number four, what was your favorite book growing up? So it was a series called The Naughtiest Girl at School. Um, and it was about a girl who um, was going to school at a British boarding school. And she somehow would always get into trouble. And I, I loved every time those books came out. Number five, if you could teleport somewhere right now, where would you go? Ooh, I would go right now. I would go to any place that had a beach um, and was warm. So I'm going to say the Bahamas. Number six, if you could have one superpower, what would it be? The power of invisibility, because I'm pretty shy <laughs> normally. And I would love to be able to like go places, but like hide out and be able to experience things, but like not like really be there. <laughs> Number seven, what was your favorite cartoon as a kid? Ooh, that's a hard question. Um, you know, I really, huh. Okay, I have two answers for this. One, I really loved Bugs Bunny as a kid growing up. And two, when I was in late high school, early college, there was this cartoon on television called Gargoyles that I loved, loved, loved so, 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 so much. And I actually was thinking that maybe I would try to find like, DVD of like that original cartoon series and watch it with my kids because that's how much I loved it. Number eight, what was your favorite rainy day activity? Oh, reading for sure. That was that was my go-to for rain. Number nine, if you could have any three dinner guests, who would they be? Three dinner guests. Uh huh. Okay. So Gabriel Garcia Marquez 
who is um, a Caribbean author. Um, and he is still was. Um, his, his books are like my absolute favorite books of all time. Um, Grover from Sesame Street, because I love Grover and I think he's awesome. Um, and he would be so much fun. And Gabriel Garcia Marquez, Grover, and Meghan Markle. Final number 10. What was the best piece of advice you were ever given? Ooh, the best piece of advice I was ever given was to not take anything so seriously. Um, I tend to be really hard on myself. And, um, you know, from, I've, and I've gotten that piece of advice from numerous people over the years, from my mom, from my friends, from my dad, from my brother, um, to not take things so seriously. And that is still something that I'm working on. I'm a lot better at it now, but um, that is definitely the best piece of advice I have ever gotten. You did wonderfully. Thank you so much for doing that. And thank you so much for spending this time with us. We cannot wait to read your future books. Thank you so much for having me. You guys were great. What a great interview. Thank you.